Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now it's 2020 and Intel are still releasing Celeron processors. This is the G5900, quite possibly the most bottom of the barrel CPU to appear on the market. No one has reviewed it and no one really talks about it, though with a recommended retail price of 42 US dollars, it could be a great foot in the door of the Intel Socket 1200 platform. You know, maybe you want to test that fancy new motherboard before slapping an i5 in there, or just update a BIOS. That's what a lot of people would assume this is good for, but I, however, am a man of particular tastes, and this budget CPU is more exciting to me than any quad-core processor. Why? Well, it makes me wonder. I wonder if this Celeron will be faster than that snail I saw on my walk home, or... I wonder if my computer will actually be usable. As a reviewer, a product that makes me ask questions before even unboxing them is a product that to me is far more exciting than something that you know is going to be good. So the Celeron G5900, it has two cores and uh, yeah, that's it really. It's a 58 watt chip with no turbo boost and no hyper threading. And to be honest, I wouldn't recommend it for anything besides basic usage as two cores will likely prove problematic in games. Google Chrome, by the way, runs like a charm. So if you bought this to build a family member, a cheap system, then they'd probably be happy with it for the most part, as it certainly ticks a box in that regard. But that's boring, so now we're gonna try and game on it. So pairing this with a 1080 Ti would be ridiculous in the real world, but doing it for the purpose of testing allows the chip to reach its maximum potential. That said, it still seems like overkill, and I did initially test this chip with not only the 1080 Ti, but with a 1050 Ti too, which represents a more realistic experience, but the difference in performance with games was negligible in most titles, and the CPU was still hitting 100% usage long before the graphics card. This just means that you get to a certain point in terms of the graphics card you choose, and then there's no point going any higher. First of all then, it's GTA 5. This is an absolute stutter fest. It's so bad that I didn't bother recording an average frame rate, first of all, because it was quite obviously uh, bad. Yeah, there's really no other word for it. But I did discover that if you enable VSync at half your monitor's refresh rate from the graphical menu, in this case, 37.5 then performance will be much smoother and this probably goes for a lot of the tested games today when they don't run normally under different conditions for example when vsync is off gta enjoys a good dose of cpu power and it's always taken issue with dual cores even back in the days of the g3258 but i'm glad to see that the missing texture issues are now gone when using modern two core CPUs. It used to be that the floor textures would disappear as you were walking around and sometimes other environments wouldn't load in, but I guess it's playable if you limit the frame rate. Now Red Dead Redemption 2 didn't really seem to care all that much about the two core chip in our system. Well, it severely hurt performance, don't get me wrong, when compared to a standard quad core or more, processor but the game ran with over 30 fps on average and wasn't as stuttery as i had first assumed it would be the game was running on high and it's more gpu intensive which means that it tends to be happy with a four core processor anything more is of course a bonus but if you end up with the celeron g5900 here then you should have an okay time in this game and I didn't really think I'd be saying that. To reiterate my earlier point, testing any game including this one with a weaker graphics card like a 1050 Ti will yield similar results because of how weak the chip is. I have to say it's doing better than I thought it would, especially here, and the modern architecture means that you'll actually be able to start some modern games. They won't just crash immediately like they might with older processors. Those older processors that lacked certain instruction sets, for example. How each game will run though, well, yeah, that depends on just 
how well it enjoys to cause. Next, it's Warzone. This will run at 30 FPS just about, but again, there will be dips. It probably goes without saying that anyone looking to spend as little on a new processor as possible should turn their attention to Intel's own Pentium lineup, which has hyper-threading, or AMD's Athlon chips, namely the 3000G, as this also has four threads and would make quite the difference not only in games, but in CPU intensive workloads or even general usage. This Warzone footage was once again taken from a practice match, but the figures were taken from combining three online games performance stats. Interestingly, the difference between off and online games is next to non-existent in this case, so whatever option you choose, the Celeron will panic, and that's a given. Moving on to Crisis Remastered, and this isn't the best at utilising all that a CPU has to offer, but it certainly maxed out the Celeron no matter the settings. That's something worth noting too. It doesn't really matter what settings you choose because the chip is going to struggle regardless. This isn't a gaming CPU, nor is it advertised as one by Intel, so I went into this with limited expectations to begin with, and it's not until our next game that the chip really surprised me. Well, honestly, Red Dead 2 surprised me quite a lot, but I found something that will run at 60 FPS, and that is Apex Legends. That's right, even at high, Apex Legends cares little enough about the processor that it will run at over 60 FPS most of the time, with the settings turned way up. At least it did during my gameplay. Even the 1.1% lows were decent enough, though I will admit that the occasional hiccup might be enough to throw you off, which isn't ideal for online competitive play. It seems like Celeron CPUs are turning a corner though, but I'd like to see them come with hyper-threading next time around. It's about time the Pentium's got four cores, and the Celeron's got at least four threads. I mean, I don't think Intel could go another generation without making these changes at the lower end, unless they price them really, really low. I think a quad-core Pentium for $50 or pounds or whatever the equivalent in your chosen currency would go down very well among, well, people like myself and a lot of you watching as well who like the cheaper tech. Let's finalise with a quick, well maybe not quick, but a Cinebench R20 multi-thread test. This thing's about 100 points better off than Intel's first core i3, the 530, and sits closest to an i3-5300U, which I believe is a mobile processor. Like I said, it's okay for everyday computing, and honestly, if all you play is Apex Legends, then it will do fine in that regard, and it'll even put up a decent fight in Red Dead Redemption 2, which isn't something I thought I'd be saying at the end of this video. But I mean, there we go. Let me know what you think of the Celeron down below. Now, I think if you are going with something low end like this, then as I said before, a Pentium for a little more money would be a better choice, or for a very similar amount, the 3000G from AMD would also be a good choice because you do get the AM4 platform as well, which some might argue is a wiser investment. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Let me know if you own one of these chips and what you think of it. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully I'll see you all in the next one.